And the last case of the morning, People versus White. Good morning. Let the, may, may just a moment. Oh, Let yes. the room settle just a bit. Okay. You may proceed now. Good morning. May it please the court. I'm attorney James Lawrence representing the defendant appellant Thomas White and I would like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal if possible. Uh, if possible. I'd, I'd like to begin by uh, noting that uh, my client was permitted by the circuit court to withdraw his plea. I think we would concede that if the plea is withdrawn, then it cannot have any waiver effect. My colleague has written a fine brief showing many reasons why this plea should not have been withdrawn, and I hope that I've provided an adequate brief showing reasons why it should have been withdrawn. Uh, under the circumstances, uh, it's hard to see how you could have an abuse of discretion when an abuse of discretion is defined as outside the principled range of outcomes. I believe that a reasonable jurist could find that this defendant was not that the plea was not knowing and voluntary under the circumstances because of facts withheld. And if any reasonable jurist could find that way, then there hasn't been an abuse of discretion. The Court of Appeals is wrong. Now, this case provides a number of interesting uh, philosophical questions, such as when has a party or entity been given notice? When is a party or entity waive something? Uh, the modern rule that this court has that the Michigan courts have been using is that if there is some sort of minor defect in service, that that does not mean there is no service. That's what the court rule says, MCR 2.105 J3. That's what the Court of Appeals ruled in Penny versus ABA Pharmacy. That if there's actual notice, then these technical re notice requirements don't apply. That's uh, what, yes. Your argument about the uh, exercise of discretion on the withdrawal is a little bit undermined by the fact that there weren't very many findings made that would seem to uh, be required to upset the finality of a plea. I think that a reasonable jurist could readily find, as this judge did, that this defendant was, it was not a knowing and intelligent plea because of what was withheld from the defendant by the prosecutor's office. You have to understand that the Department of Corrections gave correct information to the prosecutor's office, including his SID number, 0890723T, but they mistakenly looked up a different SID number, 0890731P, that just happened to be Juliet Smith. Now, when they looked at that at the prosecutor's office, they should have known right away, something's wrong here. This isn't Thomas White's record. This is the record of Juliet Smith. Was there Smith. a misrepresentation? Uh, uh, this is an, a singular case. The, this is a, the defendant who seems to know more law than his lawyer who had both filed a 180-day inquiry of, of uh, the predecessor uh, judge, Judge Cox, and then of Judge Parker raising this 180-day rule. And the, at the, at the uh, hearing held, at which the plea was eventually taken, this issue was put to the prosecutor, and the prosecutor essentially said, no way, There's, we don't have any indication that there's a, there's a uh, uh, MDOC letter. Well, it's our it, was that was that in fact true? Okay, there was an MDOC letter. Therefore, the prosecutor's representation was not correct. I'm not saying that the prosecutor intentionally lied. Well, tell but, me what the effect of the of, that's a misrepresentation. Yeah. Well, it, it was not in fact a, an accurate representation. Well, what is the effect of that representation at that hearing? 
on January 28th, 2012. Well, well, our position is that the misrepresentation meant that the plea was not knowing and intelligent because if this gentleman had been properly informed, that is, if the prosecutor had walked into court with the notices, the judge said, I would have dismissed. And so, uh, the defendant wasn't told that he had this right to dismissal, only the only reason he's not getting it is that the prosecutor's office didn't come forward with the information. If you reward prosecutors minute, but the, for not- The trial court said that she would not have, have uh, accepted the plea had she known, but the re issue is, is the, the defendant's knowledge and awareness. Well, I guess I would say this, that no rational person in the world would waive the right to complete dismissal if they were properly informed. Uh, that the mere fact that this was done mean, means that as a practical matter, what you're talking about is if a defendant purports to waive something like this in the plea, you're talking about a plea that's necessarily not knowing and intelligent or that there's ineffective counsel or that you've got an incompetent defendant because no competent person knowing I can get a complete dismissal, I'm entitled to it by law, would say I'm going to go ahead and get convicted anyway. Uh, now, the uh, concerning uh, the prosecutor's position on notice, uh, they said, well, the fact that they actually received notice, that's irrelevant. The fact that they replied to the notice, that's irrelevant. What they think is relevant is look at the envelope. If it has certified mail on it, that means one thing. If the envelope doesn't say that, it means something else. They take the position the defendant has the burden of proof. So the defense says, fine, show us the envelope. Oh, we threw it away. How can you possibly put the burden on, of proof on the party that does not have custody of the evidence and relieve the party that does have the custody of the evidence of the burden of proof? Isn't this all a side issue? If they made a misrepresentation, that, that clearly this, this defendant was focused like a laser on, had done more than almost certainly his lawyer had done, to try and raise the issue. If they made a misrepresentation about the fact of the notice, isn't that really what this is all about? Uh, yes, however, I feel that given the ruling of the Court of Appeals, I need to address some of their other findings. Okay. And uh, we have a question about, a philosophical question, when has a party waived something? Now, the prosecutor, they have an express written waiver in writing that they issued. They are a party trained in the law. They didn't take action for over five years. Mr. White is in his cell about to get out. And they say, well, sorry, uh, we have this new case for you. So he doesn't get out. Now, the, uh, according to the prosecutor, the only issue is, did it arrive in the right envelope? Now, contrast that with the situation of Defendant White. He was not, there's no express waiver, not written, not oral. He's not told, by the way, Mr. White, we want you to know, you plead, you're waiving this whole 180 day rule thing. Nobody ever tells him that. Uh, documents were withheld to mislead him. And they say uh, the prosecutor's claiming that that's an implied waiver, and yet the actual waiver by the real prosecutor is somehow invalidated. That's totally inconsistent. The prosecutor and the Court of Appeals is using a standard that the defendant needs almost nothing to waive, but if there's even a single T that's uncrossed, then the prosecutor has not waived anything. Would you like to reserve some time? Uh, yes, I will do that. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Madonna Blanchard on behalf of the people. This court has repeatedly held that a defendant waives all possible defenses when he unconditionally pleads guilty. Accordingly, this court should affirm the Court of Appeals opinion reversing the circuit court's decision for three reasons. First, the letter sent by the Department of Corrections did not trigger the 180-day rule because it did not comply with the plain language of the statute. Second, 
Regardless of whether the people had notice of defendant's incarceration, the defendant waived any possible violation under the 180 day rule when he unconditionally pled guilty. And third, defendant's unconditional guilty plea was entered into knowingly and voluntarily. At this time, I welcome any questions. Yeah, I, I'm deeply offended by your second argument. That even if you, the, the, the people are, are here not to get convictions, but to do justice. And your argument is essentially, even if we knew that there was this letter from the Department of Corrections, he waived it. And, and I looked at the hearing uh, on January 28th. It was quite clear that, they were f that, that the defendant himself was very focused on trying to get relief under the 180 day rule. I'm, I'm prepared to believe that when, uh, when Ms. Hutting said to the judge, the only thing I can add is he would be accurate uh, that, that uh, the statute's very good, clear that, uh, that there is a, 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 I'm sorry, that the letter from the EOC does not exist in this case. I'm willing to assume that Ms. Hutting did not know of this DOC letter. That is absolutely correct. Right. However, that's a misrepresentation on, on what the reality is. You, no. can, you can argue all you want that the, it was defective, it, it didn't set the tolling, but at this point, if it had been in the file, Ms. Hutting should have brought it to the attention of the court and the defendant and said, we do have this, but it's not effective. Do you, do you not think that that was the op would have been the obligation if Ms. Hutting was aware of it? If Ms. Hutting was aware of it, which she was not, okay, and it was in our files, then she should have, yes, pr provided it to the court. But our records did not have a letter for this defendant with this birthday. And there was an error in the court system. I, you know, uh, I so we did not have the letter. I understand. Or the response. I, but, but the actual representation made was false. Not in the, perhaps not knowingly by Ms. Hunting, but it was in fact false. <coughs> well, under the information she had at the time, after I, it, it's I don't, not. I don't it care was, what information she had. The, the prosecutor's office had awareness that a letter had come and it had this defendant's specific DOC number on it. I, I would argue whether the prosecutor's office had actual notice under the statute. I, you're quibbling. I'm sorry? It had a notice from the department with this defendant's specific prison number, correct? The notice included defendant's prison number, correct. <coughs> okay. But now, my, my, my question is, this is the focus of the January 28th hearing. Am I entitled to be to have relief under the 180 day rule and the prosecutor makes a representation, we never got any notice. That to me strikes me as a problem in the plea taking. No, it's You're arguing, yeah, but we get the benefit of it. No, that is not the case. What the situation is here is that defendant raised a 180 day claim violation. He has the burden to provide proof of whether notice was sent to the prosecutor's office. The people looked in their records and notice was not discovered for this defendant. When defendant filed his motion to withdraw his guilty plea, I, who do not have the burden to do this, and appellate counsel did not do this either, and defense counsel did not do this, was contact MDOC to see what did MDOC perhaps send any notice that we didn't have records of because there was an issue of the birthday or whatever. That's when we received the notice from the Michigan Department of Corrections that notice was sent to us and they also provided us with our response which we did not have records of for this defendant because it did not our Your response is makes it even worse well because you say you, you at some point you say we don't have anything pending here judge even if so the people at the time and defense counsel who has the burden did not provide any proof and the people were not aware of the notice for this defendant now the, our response it doesn't change things because the notice that the defendant, the Department of Corrections sent did not even trigger the 180 day rule because it did not comply with the plain language of the statute. It Counsel, did not I include all I'm of the requirements. I'm not sure you've answered the Chief Justice's question though exactly. I, he, I think what the Chief Justice was asking about was kind of a simple 
thresh threshold question about whether the plea was knowing involuntary. The, the, and I, I think you agree about the basic facts because the defendant comes into court. He says, you know, I'm going to plead. I'm going to plead guilty, but before I do, I have this question about X. The prosecutor says, yep, X. And it turns out that not X is, is actually true, right? And if not X is actually true, but he pled guilty on the assumption that X was true, how can we say, how can we answer this threshold question about the knowingness and voluntariness of his plea in the affirmative? How can, how can we say that was a knowing and voluntary plea? Well, I guess the question is, is whether the people have the burden to prove defendant's claim. According to the no, people's record, the question to answer is a threshold yet. question. I thought the Chief Justice was just asking a threshold question about how do we say that this was a knowing and voluntary plea when everybody in the courtroom said X and actually not X was no, true. No. You don't have the burden, but you have the burden not to mislead. Well, it's not misleading if the people, according to the information they had, was that there was no notice sent by the Michigan Department of Corrections. It's, it's, not, it's not misleading in any way, intentional or not. It's, because it's just wrong. Okay, let, let's put aside misleading because we're getting caught up with that word. It's plain in, wrong. It's false. It's but you're false. actually saying, no, it was actually accurate. Even though this, this prosecutor, uh, Ms. Hutting, did not know what you found out, it's still okay. No, that I, I agree. The statement is inaccurate. Okay, all right, okay. Yes. That's the problem I have. Right. The statement Ms. Hutting made, there is no uh, MDOC notice, was inaccurate. Yes. And so how does that affect the plea that was later taken based on that inaccurate representation? Well, because defendant doesn't need to knowingly waive the protections under the 180-day rule. People v. Jones, the Michigan Court of Appeals case, under the um, a similar context under interstate agreement on detainers, so that a defendant doesn't need to knowingly and intentionally waive his protections well, under. I, just a moment. Mm -hmm. I, I do understand these <coughs> concepts, he, except here, he made. When you make a plea, you, you, you waive lots of things. But here he made a specific point about, am I entitled to protection? And the prosecutor said, that hasn't been triggered. We have not got any in indication from the department on this question. That's, he's asked the question and put the prosecutor on, on the, uh, the burden of responding, and they responded inaccurately. That's not the same thing as waiving things that aren't at, uh, even made at issue. He's made a, a, um, a plea based on an erroneous understanding of what was going on. Isn't that different? You had a and, if it, and if you're going to say it isn't, isn't that a problem? Well, Your Honor, the defendant asked the question, and the people provided the defendant with an answer for what they knew. The, but that it does was not erroneous. stop the defendant. Just a moment. It which was, was erroneous. Which was inaccurate, okay. according to the information they had at the time. But that does not remove defendant's burden to have to prove his claim. By asking the, the prosecutor what information we have, that's, th that is an end of the claim. The prosecutor is not testifying. If this has been a Brady violation, I mean, this isn't, it, it, it's kind of linking up in my mind to Brady. Is there any inculpatory? Uh, exculpatory material in your file and the prosecutor says no, that's a problem, isn't it? If that's an, an If the accurate. prosecutor knew there was exculpatory... Even if the prosecutor didn't know, but there was. Well, if the prosecutor didn't know at the time the information that they have, if there is no exculpatory evidence, the prosecutor would be lying no, if she said no. yes. The prosecutor if she didn't know doesn't the real know, evidence. but there is in fact exculpatory evidence. If the prosecutor act, answers inaccurately, <laughs> about the status of the, uh, the file, that's still a problem. Well, wow. Your Honor, it's inaccurate in hindsight, but at the time, based on the information that she has in front of her, it, it would not be inaccurate. And at the time, she did not have any notice, and nobody contacted, the defendant did not make any steps to meet his burden, approving that 180-day rule was violated. Uh, and I know that, oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to get off on a tangent here, but you seem to be conceding that Brady applies no, in the I plea. Don't. No, I am I, not. I thought you did. In, no, in I your am answer, not. you said there, there might be a plea, there, there might be a Brady violation if there had been some inculpatory mm. information. If, if in the context of exculpatory now, evidence, I, I don't think that this is in, um, applies in this case because this doesn't okay. prove defendant's 
Because Mr. And Lawrence has engaged that issue thus far, and you have not in response to the best of my recollection. No, this, this statute does not deal, doesn't um, remove defendant's guilt or innocence. It's just whether defendant has been brought to trial within 180 days. And if he hasn't, then this court, the courts would lose personal jurisdiction. But defendant can waive that protection under people v. Long, which held that it, it can be waived. True, but it and ought to be knowingly and intelligently. No, defendant doesn't, no? doesn't need to waive the 180-day rule protections knowingly and intelligently. It just I needs to be waived to voluntarily. Be, I thought the pleas had to be made with those. A guilty plea standards. has to be made knowingly and intel intelligently, but waiver of the protections of the 180-day rule does not. Just as if a defendant requests an adjournment, he doesn't need to be advised of the right that by, re by you requesting this adjournment, you are now waiving any protection protections under the 180-day rule because you've extended the time under, under the rule. He does but not need the to analogy to an adjournment really doesn't fit here because five years passed. Well, it could, there have been cases where years have passed where defendant has participated in extending the time of when defendant can be brought to trial and oh, by, by his choice. And it, no, in no case has it been required under the 180-day rule or interstate agreement on de detainers, which is a very similar circumstance where defendant needs to have been, or defendant had to be informed that he was waiving any protections under those rules. So it doesn't need to be a knowing or intelligent waiver of the protections, it just needs to be voluntary, as if he voluntarily pled guilty under these circumstances. And even if defendant had known, or his counsel did contact the Michigan Department of Corrections, as he is required to, to meet his burden to prove this claim, then all he would have received was a defective notice, a notice that did not trigger the 180-day rule. The notice did not comply with the statute, and this court has said before that it, it, if the plain language of the statute is there and it's uh, not ambiguous, then the courts must adhere to the plain language of the statute, and there are at least seven requirements in this notice that was not adhered to. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Just, just to clarify in my mind, but when members of this court ask you whether it's okay for the defendant to ask for something and you respond with X when the answer is not X, what exactly is the question being asked there? You, you, you seem to accept that that was what existed in this case. What was the question to which the answer X was given when the right answer would, or the, the honest and fair answer would have been not X? Well, there wasn't a clear question on the I'm not record. I'm calling it to question that characterization. I just want to understand specifically what it is that um, you accept was done wrongly here. Well, I, I don't think that anything was intentionally done wrong. What happened here? I understand was, that. I understand. What yeah. happened here was that when in context of defendant's motion under the 180-day rule violation, the people informed the court that they did not have any notice that complied with the 180-day rule. Was it that final response that we don't have a valid 180-day notice as required by the statute, or was it a more generic answer? That, the response was more along the lines of, we did not receive a notice sent by certified mail from the Michigan Department of Corrections. That was more along the lines of what okay. was said. If the question was, do you have a 180-day notice, and because of two or three deficiencies in what was communicated by MDOC, it was your view that it was not a valid notice. Do you think that would have been a fair answer? We don't have such a notice as, as you I, I think that the prosecutor would still say that there, we did not receive such a notice because in her, at the time, she was not even aware that any notice was sent, even the one with deficiencies. I understand deficiency. that, but that's not my question. If you knew exactly what you had in your possession, and the question was whether or not you've received a 180-day triggering notice or something to that effect, would it have been a fair answer, the answer that you gave? The, the same answer that she gave in this case, if she had known, if she did know yes. that the letter was sent? I think that in that situation, the prosecutor would provide the defendant with the notice that was received if she had it. I, I see my time is up. Any Keep, further? You can answer the question. Did I, did I not answer the question already? If you think that's done, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. 
Well, uh, I'll try to be quick, even though it's against my nature. Uh, Go against your nature. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, what I see consistently being ignored here is the prosecutor's unconditional waiver of the right to prosecute this man. They issued the form. They signed it. They are legally trained. That was an unconditional waiver. Now, uh, I guess I have a question about the burden of proof being on the defendant as to all issues here, and I want you to think about this carefully. Do we want to have a whole bunch of hearings on the question of whether a letter was sent by certified mail? And isn't every prosecutor's office going to throw out the envelope so as to make it impossible for the defendant to prove what kind of mail was used? The, if, uh, I admit the statute says that, but the <coughs> argument that the prosecutor's making, the same argument rejected in People v. Hawkins, same rejected in People v. Hamilton, where the defense was saying, look, there's a statute about how search warrants must be followed. And this court ruled, no, uh, the statute doesn't provide a remedy for that statutory violation, therefore it is completely ineffective. And the same was true about the statutory violation about arrests. But, but you do agree that the lack of certification is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of the deficiencies in the correspondence that was in the possession of the prosecutor, don't you? Well. First of all, I don't concede that there was a failure of certified mail. There is no evidence one way or the other. And if you put this burden on... You might on have actually developed that, or the defendant's counsel might have developed that if they'd done anything to act on the defendant's perfectly well-formulated theory that he, had, he was entitled to protection. Well, had they contacted, for example, the Department of Corrections, they might have uh, learned that yes, we did send this, and yes, we sent it out by certified uh, mail because that's the only way we send these. You could have developed that information, or the, 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 the trial counsel could have developed that information. Well, uh, I can't deny that somebody could have tried to do that, to the try to find somebody trying. from the mailroom to remember, I handled this letter five years ago, and I remember it was sent out this way rather than that way. I, my the point, is, needs my to point be, is that it's not only within the contemplation of, or, of the prosecutor. The trial defense trial counsel could have done this as well and, and presented that to, to Judge Parker on the 28th. Okay. I don't believe so for this reason. You mean you don't believe the defense counsel couldn't have contacted the Department of Corrections and asked if, this, uh, if, if a letter had been sent? How would the, the, the letter was sent by one employee. They don't even know which employee sent out the letter, uh, which employee of the mailroom. You don't think they have the a record room. of the, the letters they send out? Uh, I'm sorry? You don't think the department has a record of the letters they issue? That's right. I don't think that. And, uh, and you the know we, that to be true. Uh, when I have contacted the Department of Corrections about this in another case, they inform me that they have no way of determining whether a letter was sent out by certified <laughs> mail or not. It was too long ago. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We are concluded.